The following is intended for mature audiences only. Discretion is advised. Thank you so much for downloading this episode of So What Do You Really Do? The podcast where I, your host, Dedder Dennis Mount, talks to artists and entertainers about their day jobs and the artist and entertainer whose day job we're talking about is my friend out in L.A., Adam Cagley. Adam Cagley is a comedian and I... It's back, you guys. Pandemic friend. <laughs> Pandemic friend who I still have not met in real life, even though we were both in L.A. Uh, back in February, uh, he was there. Uh, I was there visiting, doing shows. He was there working on the new novel that he's about to release this year. Uh, it was fun to talk and catch up with Adam and I have done our entire lives. <laughs> our entire relationship has been online together. Obviously, we did Zoom shows. We both worked uh, for Flappers during the pandemic. We've done, I think this now ma- marks the fourth podcast that we've done together. Third podcast. He did my Word of the Day with Comedians. I did his movie, uh, Comedians Ruin Movies podcast. And now we're doing So What Do You Really Do together. So I guess that makes us uh, three podcast time guests. We've been guesting on each other's podcasts. And if he has another one, I guess I'll be a guest on that one too. <laughs> uh, Adam is a actor turned comedian turned novelist. Uh, born and raised in LA. He is a friend. He is one of those people that epitomizes what I've been talking about of the good things that came out of the pandemic. Uh, Adam and I just hit it off initially, instantly uh, through Zoom shows, and we would just hang out and talk off Zoom and just text each other. Mostly a lot of gossiping. We did a lot of gossiping throughout the pandemic off and on, but it's been fun having him as a friend. Hopefully, Later this year, this winter, when I go back to L.A., we'll actually meet face-to-face. One can hope. Uh, we have the same interest in things. We're both huge uh, Kevin Smith fans, uh, and we have similar taste in comedy and entertainment. Uh, and it was great sitting down and having a great long conversation about his history because I knew he was an actor, and I know he's been in things, but we never talked about the story of it. Sometimes you just become friends with people and you don't know their back history. You don't know their story. You don't know their origin. So it's really nice to meet friends and then bring them on the show and then start from how did you get in the business and where are you at today and what do you expect? And that was what the conversation between Adam and I is on this episode of the podcast. Like I said, he has a new book coming out. It's a horror comedy book. We talk about it. Pre-orders are now available. Get his book. Check him out. Please enjoy my conversation with actor, comedian, and writer Adam Cagley. I usually just try to naturally do it, and I can just tell people to start trying to jump around. I'm like, whoa, whoa, I'm building a story here. I'm building a story. No, no, I'll, I'll follow you. I, I'm trying to build a narrative. You're, you're, you're the professional. I'm just the dude who wrote the silly monster book. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to build a mystery. I mean, I guess I should be more sensitive to that, seeing as that's what I wrote, but. <laughs> Yeah, you should be wanting to follow a path and a story because you yourself have written a path and a story. But I mean, I'm, I'm also, I'm the horror writer who wrote a horror book that's got a dick joke on every page. So. <laughs> <laughs> Which, speaking of dick jokes, where did all of this as a young youth start with you? Because I know you start, you born and raised in LA, right, Adam? Yeah, yeah. Which, that that's not a phrase that most people say, especially when it's like, born and raised there. Um, and also not involved with entertainment. Luckily you are, where did you, where and when did you start your career with entertainment? Um, so my, my, my sister was a choreographer for a theater company and they were doing a production that was like a show about kids putting on a play. (laughs) And she was like, Hey, we need a kid to like play the director of the play. He'd be like, you're basically just going to stand on stage and, tell the other child actors what to do. And I was like, I got nothing better going on. Um, <laughs> Cause I was, I was eight and I didn't. <laughs> so I, I, I did it. Um, I, ended, I ended up doing like, like three or four different productions with this little production company. That was, that was just child productions. Um, Which already sounds sketch in its own right. I mean, honestly, it had every right to be just like, the sketchiest thing imaginable. It really wasn't. <laughs> it was very chill. Everyone was, was very respectful of the kids. And I mean, there were a lot of like 
my child's gonna be a star. And it's like, no, she's not. Yeah, a lot of the tiger moms. Yeah, it's, it's like, moms. it's like, it's like your your kid's a solid like four out of ten. She's not gonna be a star. <laughs> talent. We're talking about talent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what what one of one of the kids in the cast though uh, had an agent and was like doing commercials, and she brought her agent to the show. Um, and the agent approached my parents after the show instead of her client's parents and was like, I want to represent your son. And my, 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 my mom was like, bullshit. What do you want from us? Like, you want to represent my son? How much money do you want? Cause like, that's a path we had explored, uh, when I was like, maybe like five or six. And it was one of those like very shady talent agencies that you get in LA that are like, well, if you pay us, you know, six thousand dollars for headshots and acting classes, we'll represent your kid, and then you take the acting classes and you get the headshots, and they're like, ah, never mind. Yeah. Um. So my mom, my, well, that's my very parents, familiar, very yeah. familiar here in Boston too, as well. Uh, and I've been, I mean, it, it was a pretty common thing back in like the nineties. Oh yeah, the the pay for play model, which is like yeah. all your dreams will come true for a prize. I mean, even, even then, like there there are casting studios out here now that are like casting directors that are like, well, if you take classes with me, I'll get you auditions, and then they don't. Yeah, well, it's also like there? like I when I started diving head deep into the acting out here in in Boston, when I registered with Boston Casting, I knew the easiest way to get my face in front of the casting directors and get them to know my name and get them familiar with me was to take their acting classes was to take their their comedy classes and do all these pay all this money i was like not going to do that i've already i went to an acting high school i acted in theater before that i'm not going to say that i'm freaking you know uh you know uh uh, daniel day lewis but i've got some skills right i i know i can I can stand on a mark and not look at the camera and say a line, like, and not fall down. Like, I can do that. I can handle hey, that. me too. Yeah, right. That's why I like doing background work. It's $20, $22 an hour, two free meals. All you have to do is not look at the camera and not fall down, unless they ask yeah. you to fall down. In which case, <laughs> that is a stunt bump. Don't yeah. fall down for free, kids. <laughs> and then when so, you do fall down, you fall down so fucking well. <laughs> you, you fall, fall down like you've like never Michael fallen Douglas. before. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, my trick to getting in front of them was honestly a going every audition and casting call they call because it's free to do that. But here, Boston casting did this one, and a lot of them do this. Well, they do the Q and A night, or it's like come talk sure. to a casting actor because yeah. the casting director wants you to come. They want you to talk to him so they can sell you on their classes and stuff, yeah. right? And it's not necessarily a scheme to say, hey, we offer these classes. We'll see you more often if you're Mm -hmm. in these classes, and then we will likely know you better to put you up for things. But what I do is I go to the free Q&A sessions, and I make it a fucking show all about fucking Dead Air Dennis. (laughs) It is, I got questions, I got bits, I'm doing jokes, I'm dropping names, I'm doing everything. I'm cracking them up, so when they walk out, they're like, look, that Dead Air Dennis guy was hilarious. You remember him? They're going to talk about me tomorrow when they go, hey, we need a white guy from Boston to, to play a role because every role in Boston is a white guy, unless it's the TV show Smelf. That's a whole other story. But There's a what? The TV show called what now? What? Smelf? Single Mother, I'd Like to Fuck. It was a Showtime or a Cinemax show. Uh, it was a comedy uh, starring, oh, what was her name? She's from this Boston area. Terrible actress. Somebody it, spent money on that. Show. Yeah, they did two seasons. <laughs> it was terrible. It was not very. And good. At, and at no and at no point were they like, maybe we change the title. No, because th- that's what the show is about. It's about this struggling working actress who has a kid, and she's living in the 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 slums of South Boston, which is all gentrified now. There's no slums, but yeah. it's her trying to get an acting career while being a single mom and all this. And the show was not good at all. Uh, Frankie something was her name, but. She I mean, I, I don't know how it couldn't have been with a pitch like that. Right? It, it was not. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. The reason the show got Emmy canceled. Bait. Is That's what that is. They, uh, pulled all of their tax release. The show got uh, canceled because they pulled all of their tax benefits for Massachusetts because they were segregating writers by ethnicity. One. Two. The reason they, they got looked upon that is because they had a standing order of no white males on the show that hadn't already been casted in principal roles. Okay. And then there was apparently uh they violated a uh nudity clause in one of the actors uh contracts. Samantha Weaving. 
Hugo Weaving's Hugo Weaving, the Red Skull. Y- y- Fucking uh, Lord Elrond. Lord Elrond and uh from the Matrix with the glasses, whatever that was. Agent, 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 Agent Smith. Agent Smith. His yeah. niece is Samantha Weaving. She's an actress. They made her do a nude scene, even though it was against her contract to do so. So all this stuff, they lost wow. their tax credit, they lost money, Cinemax or Showtime, whatever it was, canceled the wow. show. It was a catastrophe. And I, from the people I heard who worked on it, there's much more worse stories. But anyway, getting back. Oh yeah, to that, I mean, like yeah. that's that's tip of the iceberg. If that's if that's public knowledge, you can only imagine the nonsense that happened behind the scenes. I put Jesus. I, I listened in, in while while doing background work on things. I listened to other actresses tell me horror stories about auditions, and then I secretly put together that all these three, four uh, actresses on three, four different sets who didn't know each other all had the very uncomfortable, very uh, not safe for work style audition. Uh, By the way, it's a female who runs a show and a female director. Like the, the whole show is ran and operated by a woman, and she is the one that kind of perpetrated all these things that got them in trouble. I sure. won't say what these actresses and actresses did because I can't verify what they're saying is true. But when four people tell you the same story of like, hey, there's a scene where they want somebody to masturbate and they want us to audition doing that. You kind of put two and two together. Not saying that that is exactly what happened. But by my assertion, pretty sure that was that show. That's gross. <laughs> I know. I like it. It only took us, by the way, three minutes to go from. I was a child actor too. Somebody had to masturbate on screen. That was that casting office had to smell like shit at the end of the day. <laughs> oh, self auditions just stank. Just <laughs> stanky walls. Welcome to the two thousands, uh, where we'll just ask you to comfortably film yourself pretending to do sex acts at home. <laughs> oh, but I mean, at least it was a self tape. Yeah, at least it was a self tape while you self tape yourself. <laughs> I mean, at least at least they didn't have to drive anywhere. That's yeah. didn't have to like deal <laughs> hey, with no traffic casting, on the way to that. The only casting couch in this in, in this audition is your own couch at home. <laughs> yes, the one in my living room. <laughs> Make sure you put down a towel. <laughs> That's gross. That's so <laughs> gross. <laughs> we want to go off for authentic. Yep, they're they're method actors. Anyway, I do I do love how quickly we got we like we took such a hard turn almost immediately and I love it. <laughs> Usually I'm pretty good at being the clean one in the conversation, not today. <laughs> no. I won't let you. <laughs> so you like and I've done the, the acting thing where you know you meet with an agent, this and that. Like my big problem is I'm I'm too distracting for background work. And I'm not handsome enough for principal work. So that's basically where I lie. And so when you you're have so stuck much in that, stuck in that here, purgatory. Yeah. I'm stuck in the, I'm, I'm a Patton Oswalt character when we already have a Patton Oswalt character. <laughs> <laughs> you need, you, do you need a best friend who's short that comes in here and just says expeditional dialogue and maybe a quip? I'm your guy. But nobody <laughs> else wants that. <laughs> So when you were a kid and you worked with this agency, like and your parents are very sus- suspect of it, which they should have been. What was that? Pro- how did that process work out? Like when you went in with them, was that your first agent? And is that the one that you yeah. stuck with? Or did you have to transfer to other ones? No, I mean, I, I, I met with them a couple times and like they had me read some stuff for them. And my, my parents were, were still very, you know, cautious and, and, and trepidatious, but she, that agent to her credit, like she, Spent a while convincing my parents, like, no, this is totally legit. This is on the up and up. I'm not trying to scam you. She was like, I do want him to take a commercial class, but that's it. And she's like, you, like, here's a list of people I like. You don't even have to pick from the list if you don't want. Um, and she, uh, we, we, I ended up signing with her, and I took the commercial class she recommended. Uh, and then my very first audition I booked. Uh, it was a, a camera commercial and a camera commercial and accompanying print ad that only ran in Japan, <laughs> which like, I mean, way later on in my career, I was, I was working on the universal back lot. Uh, you know, I, I did my first commercial when I was 10 and I was, I was maybe like, like 14 or 15 working, working on the universal back lot in the studio tour tram rolls by. I've never seen that many cameras go up at once. (laughs) Like, I 
like I'm walking to the commissary and the tram rolls by me and just like dozens of cameras, dozens of like Japanese tourist cameras just shoot up and start clicking pictures of me. And I'm walking with my dad and I'm like, what the, like (laughs) all of these tourists watch Ned's Declassified? And he's like, no, you know what it was, right? I was like, what? And he's like, you had billboards in Japan. I had no idea that there were billboards in Japan. I thought it was like, we put your picture in a magazine. Or like, you know, you're you're a thumbnail on something. I didn't think it was like, you know, a full print ad campaign. Uh, but apparently it was. And apparently, I, I mean, I, I, I take a lot of enjoyment in having the dis- having the, the ability to say, I was big in Japan. <laughs> well, you're also, <laughs> even if you weren't famous, you're still big in Japan compared to everyone else. Yes, yes. I mean, even at 14, I would have been twice their size, so. Well, and that's when those interesting, like, that's great for you where you're like, oh, this is weird and crazy. And, you know, I can under- empathize that moment. Also, now I'm thinking about that moment where that tour guide who's driving that tram around is like, all right, everybody, here's a studio lot. Oh, here's a young boy who's an actor. They're like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And it's like, OK, well, oh, not what? even like he, he he didn't even point me out. He's like, <laughs> and to the left is the Alfred Hitchcock bungalow. And then everybody starts taking pictures of me. And I'm like. I'm not. A, I'm not the bungalow. Like I'm not hitched. Like why? Like they. There. There was nothing to indicate that I was there, other than like one of them saw me and got excited. <laughs> it started taking. Like I. It was. It was. It's the only time it's happened. It never happened before. It hasn't happened since. It was the weirdest fucking thing. Uh, now, by the way, your dad was just like went straight to. Oh look, that was a whole tram full of Jap- Japanese people. That's why. Like, I, like how I mean, he, he he wasn't wrong, though. He wasn't wrong, though. <laughs> My also, like I, like I said, I'm thinking about that tour guide. Like, now, me as a tour guide for Boston Duck Tours, I think about that all the time where I'm facing everybody. I'm looking, and I'm talking about this over here, and then everybody's looking over there at something, and it's like, what are you Listen. looking at? And I look over and say, yeah. oh, it's just a tall building. Oh, here's something <laughs> significant. Oh, that's tall. Look at that. What'd you see? <laughs> That building, that's got to be at least 30 stories, Harold. Look how tall that building is. So many people just take pictures of just, oh, tall thing, click. And it's like, hey, here's an interesting thing over here. Like, here's a beautiful looking church. That is significant. Oh, not that over. Or the amount of times I've had kids on tours during the school year, like May and June when kids were still in school, they would come in and just, I'm talking like, hey, by the way, so this place is the city of Boston founded in 1630 by the Puritans. And then one gets in and goes, it's a Trader Joe's. It's like, what am I going to do here? How am I? <laughs> That's what you're, yeah, there's a Starbucks. Congratulations. You're going to work there someday. Like, I mean, yes. I mean, I, I, I live, I live two and a half miles from downtown LA. <laughs> so I a hundred percent empathize with tourists taking pictures of tall buildings. <laughs> I don't get it. Like, Ooh, tall, like, some people, rarely do people ask me about it because I talk so much that it's really difficult to interrupt me with talking, which you know how I do with comedy. Like, same thing. I don't have hecklers because they don't have a time, a chance to talk. <laughs> I mean, that's a smart strategy. Yeah. But they'll, rarely when somebody asks me, what? oh, what is this big tall building? I'm just like, it's actually just a parking garage. <laughs> I don't like those. Those are condos. Yeah. I mean, this is, here's the tallest building in new England. Like that's significant. Here's an office building. 53 state street. I know it's shiny. I don't know what else to tell you. What are they doing there? File paperwork and TPS reports. I don't know. I have no idea. You, 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 you can legitimately go into downtown and find tourists taking pictures of the stupidest shit. Yeah. Well, in like LA, were, there's like so much around you. You could just keep taking pictures in 360s and like you're oh, gonna yeah. just s- spray and pray on pictures. You're gonna find something significant or from a movie. Well, I, mean, I, I mean, like I, I, I try to go into Hollywood proper like very rarely. Particularly, I try to go to like the big Hollywood and Highland mall complex where like they host the Oscars and all that shit. I try to go there very rarely, particularly because like it's it's locals don't go there. It's a tourist yeah. place. Um. Uh, it's like every store that's in that mall, you can find somewhere else with cheaper, more accessible parking. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it also happens to be like where the closest Dave and Buster's is. And like sometimes, sometimes I want to go eat a shitty burger and, and hop in a Star Wars battle pod for four and a half hours. <laughs> um, and the last time I went, I shit you not, there was a tourist taking a picture of the elevator doors. <laughs> 
<laughs> with like a two thousand dollar like Nikon setup, huge DSLR with a lens on it and a flash, taking a picture of the elevator doors, and I'm like, there wasn't even anything special about the elevator doors other than the fact that they said Hollywood and Highland on them. I'm Which like, is not even also the real street sign. <laughs> no! I'm like, and you're taking a picture of the elevator. It wouldn't have bothered me if they hadn't delayed me from getting on the elevator. <laughs> I, I will tell you that doing tours around Boston, sometimes we'll pull up to another tour bus and they'll have like something significant on them, like the George, you know, the General George Washington statue, which is a statue sure. of General George Washington. I over explained that. Anyway, <laughs> and they'll take your picture of it and it's like, all right, and if you wait like three minutes, we're going to come up to the actual statue. Like, I don't know why you're taking a picture of a picture. Like, I was at Obama's inauguration on the ground right there doing a live radio broadcast from Obama's parade after he was inaugurated. And mm-hmm. I was sitting there in this restaurant, running the thing, watching people take pictures of the TV inside the restaurant when they could just turn around and take a picture of Obama and his actual motorcade. But the turning around to witness history was too much work. Right? It's like, if you wanted to take a picture of the TV, stay uh-huh. home. Made less crowds. Like this For crowd. real, you could have. <laughs> you could have screenshotted it on your phone and got a better resolution. So, But you want to be like, I was in a place watching this. <laughs> he passed right behind me. I ignored it. <laughs> oh, look. Waiting for- it's a Sony. It's Obama on a Sony. Click. Yeah. <laughs> On a TV that's 15 years old. <laughs> Hanging in a restaurant where you pay too much for onion rings. It's got a, it's got a resolution of 40. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, back then probably was a flip phone, Obama. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think about it. <laughs> Just the grainiest, shittiest picture. <laughs> of they a grainy, no shitty picture. Because they had to go to people's cell... This is the picture I took with my phone. Like, yeah. all right, forensic evidence. This is useless. They, they, they had to attach it in a bulk email. <laughs> they just have to so, hand over the clam phone to the police. They're like, all right, we'll just submit this phone as evidence. Can you give us? The, we need the charger too, ma'am. We need, ma'am, can you give us the charger? We're going to need to bring that to. The, the, I, here, everybody, the people, the jur- ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I'd like to present to you Exhibit A. This, uh, Nico, uh, Nokia, there we go. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, (laughs) how many present you? Exhibit A, this Nokia flip flow. Did you guys not charge this beforehand? Didn't we talk about this in the briefings? Damn it, Johnson, I told you to bring the backup battery. (laughs) Look, I I couldn't find the battery at CVS. They didn't have it at Best Buy. What am I going to (laughs) do? We're just aging ourselves with these jokes. (laughs) We just the two minutes of proprietary chargers. Yeah. <laughs> so you acting when you were uh, young, yes. uh, young, getting into acting. What was the audition process like uh, back in? I'm assuming this was early 2000s, right? Uh, yeah, that would have been like 2000, 2000 or 2001. Yeah. And, yeah, no, it would have been 2001 because I, I started professionally when I was 10. Uh, I mean, it really. The only time it's really changed has been since COVID. Like, really? Now, now it's like I get an audition and I don't know what the fuck to do with it. Um, oh no, for real! Like, like you know, spent all these years getting uh, you know self tape auditions, and then a few weeks ago, I like very randomly got an in person one, and I'm like, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> I don't know what. Do I have to put on a mask? Do I have to wear a hair yeah. net? What do I do? Well, no, like, I, I seriously, I turned it down because I was like, I don't know what I'm doing in person. Not like I don't know how to audition in person, but it's like when I was a kid, there was a process, you know, like you'd bring a headshot with your resume stapled to it. You'd sign in, you'd sit there, you'd go in, you'd read. Sometimes they'd be like, cool, go grab another set of sides and read a different character. Sometimes they'd be like, have a great day. Thank you. Sometimes you'd get a call before you even got home that you booked it. But like, now it's so different and like, you know, headshots are digital and all that. I'm like, like, do I even bring a headshot? <laughs> do I print the sides and bring them with me? Like, I know a lot of them expect you to be like hundred percent off book now. And I'm like, I'm like, I just feel like, you know, I was, I was out of it for so long after, uh, <clears throat> after my time on shameless ended that like, I, 
I feel like the games changed past me. Um, but I mean, when I was a kid, it was it was standardized. You know, you'd, you'd show up. I would I would show up, and I would always sit in a waiting room of kids and teenagers and young adults that all looked like me. And we would all go in and read for the same parts, like to the point where, like, my agent uh, represented another actor who was my type. He and I became very like we're still friends. We've been friends for like fifteen years. Uh, we used to carpool because <laughs> it was like he would get an audition and he would call me and be like, "Hey man, are you reading for this?" And I'd be like, "Yep." And he'd be like, "Cool, I'll pick you up." Or I, like I'd get an audition and I'd call him and be like, "Hey man, you reading for this?" And he'd be like, "Yep." And I'd be like, "Cool, I'll pick you up." Like, <laughs> because our times were always like weirdly like within like twenty minutes of each other too. Um, but no, I mean you'd go in with a headshot and you'd sit there. You'd have you know an appointment time for two thirty. You'd probably sit there until like three. Yeah. And you'd go in and you'd read for, you know, depending on what you're reading for anywhere between like 20 seconds and 10 minutes. And yeah, then you'd, you'd kind of go... cattle call, man. That is just so unnatural, yeah. you know, next, 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 you know, yeah. like I like the smaller things where I can go in there, talk to them, hang out, joke around. Like, oh yeah, for you sure. I mean, I, a person, I, you know, in that short little time, can yeah. you like, you know, like that's what gets them is you come, Hey, what's up? How's that thing? Oh yeah. Yeah. That, you know? That's, that's honestly like, that's, that's the thing I hate most about self tapes is like, I always felt like that was such a, a, a skill set in itself to be able to go into an audition and just bullshit with the casting people. Because then when you go to character, it makes the turn to the character that much more significant. Yeah. And if, if they like, we both know that, when they cast this, when they read this, when they decided to make this thing, they already had in their mind what they wanted visually. Mm-hmm. And if you don't fall yeah. into that thing, even if you fall into the thing, there's 10 other, 100 others exactly yep. like you. It's just a dart game at this point, you know? And yep. I don't want to take that away from anybody's skill as an actor, but that's also, I've, I went back to my old high school and talked to the acting class about that, and I was like, FYI, you're going to get turned down for things, and it's not because you weren't good, it's because you just mm-hmm. didn't look like the person that they thought was going to fill the role. And somebody yep. just got so sad and depressed by that. She was like, I guess I'm just going to quit the class. I'm like, no, 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 it's fun. But well, no, I mean, it's like, like the there, bad things. Just there, there, there were, there, there were a few instances in my experience where it's like, if you didn't look like the idea of the character they had in your head, you had to be good enough or at least memorable enough for them to rethink the way they had the character in there. Oh yeah. Th- those events happen. Those things happen. Yeah. You know, you could be Gagarin and us who come in and there's like, Hey, we're looking for a blonde, you're a blonde headed skinny guy, but you know what? Oh, you're yeah. Black hair and bearded and, and, and tall. We want you for the role. That happens so rarely though, oh, yeah. but it does happen. You're right. And it does happen. If you're that enough of a person that like, we definitely want to work with Adam. He is hilarious yeah. and funny. Seems like he's going to be a fun guy. Then, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I had I had a friend back in the day. Uh, I mean, a dude that I used to audition with looks like me. Booked a role that was written for a sixty-five-year-old black man. Just because he went in and he was reading for a different character, and they were like, "Do you want to try reading these?" And he read those, and they were like, "Yeah, this is the way to go." Yeah, and you know what? That's those are the real people in the business. Those are the things like you know you're setting up for you're working for a production that's going to be yeah. on time. And that they're gonna, you know, not jerk around. That you don't have to worry about them not sending you paychecks or yeah. going, hey, you know, if you just don't tell anybody here, like those are the practices that you want to be a part yeah. of, you know. And those exist where they're not trying to exploit somebody; they're trying to make real things, and they're honest people. But in this whole world, sometimes, you know, those I mean, are to, to, people that are there all the time. Unfortunately, that's not all the business. No. That's unfortunately the small part of the business. Yeah, I mean, to to, to go back to auditioning, it's like. I, I, I mean, when I was, when I was a kid, if I wasn't working, I was auditioning. Like I was auditioning constantly from ages like 10 to 17, like to the point where like I left public school just because I was never there. Uh, you know, if it's like I would go, I would go to class for like maybe one day a week and then I'd have to be gone you know, in the middle of a day, the next day for an audition, or I'd have to, you know, fuck off completely for like a week or two weeks to go work on a thing. Um, and I mean, you know, you, you do that long enough, you get to the point where, you know, you skip the pre-reads and you go straight to the producer sessions. And like for a while I was doing just the producer sessions. And then 
you know, things start to slow down. People forget who you are. And now you, you got to go back to the pre-reads again. And now I'm at a point where it's like, you mentioned my name and they're like, who? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. When do you get to that, that decision? Like here in Boston, there's not enough productions to where a kid can drop out of school, do homeschool and get a yeah. tutor or whatever. You know, there's barely enough work here in Boston to make a full-time career of acting. Like, it's really difficult if you don't have the availability to to either work from a laptop or just straight up ditch out and work. It's really hard to find acting work, especially if you're SAG, because there's so many non-union yeah. productions around here. Now, granted, you're afforded more availability of doing things if you're non-union, but then again, you're cut out of a lot of productions because of the union. So, this or that, whatever. LA is going to be a different thing. I assume your schools were understanding about the, all this. Because if you, I mean, yeah. you went to school like once, three days a month, no matter what your work schedule was here in Boston, yeah. they were just like, he's out, he's gone. Honest, honestly, like there were months where if I got that, I was lucky. But it was like, my my teachers thought it was the coolest shit in the world. My principal thought I was an asshole. Um, <laughs> it's like my, my, my mom, my mom was a teacher, so she was very hard on the idea of like, well, no, just because you're not there doesn't mean you're not going to do the work. Mm-hmm. So like she would go to my, if I was going to be gone for a week or two weeks, she would go to my teachers and get all the work I had to do for that time. Cause it's like, you know, before you're 18, you have to do a certain amount of, of, of set tutoring with a, a set tutor throughout the day. It's like, it's like three hours you have to do throughout the course of the day. Um, so I would have all the work anyway. And then it just got to a point where it's like, it makes more sense to just homeschool me because I'm never there anyway. And I'm doing all the work like, at home or on sets anyway. Um, I mean, I, when, when, when my parents pulled me out of public school and, and started homeschooling me, they started homeschooling me through a program that was particularly for uh, kids in the industry. Just because it had become such a common thing. And, like, schools are okay with it, but they're really not. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, you know, when I, when I was in public school, I was under a much more scrutinous microscope than any other kid in my class. Like, like, I mean, I was, I was also bullied like terribly for it because I was never there. And it was like, I was leaving to go be on TV and kids hated that. Um, yeah, I guess when you're growing up in LA and you're not part of that program, you know, like if you're not part of that entertainment world, you just probably don't, you resent those people, those kids that, yeah. Oh, you're a big old Hollywood super. Like, even even outside of that entertainment world, if you present yourself as anything more than what the local community is, somehow different, somebody's gonna catch you know mm-hmm. uh, you know a fault with it. Well, I mean, it's it's like I I was I was never there. The days I were there, the days I was there, I would leave early, but I was still top of my class, national honor society, and a uh, uh, state speech champion. It's <laughs> so, like. I was kicking the shit out of the other kids anyway. So like, because of that, uh, uh, there was an instance where I was dragged into the bathroom and stabbed with a ballpoint pen. Oh my God. Principal tried to suspend me for it. What? That's, I mean, I was in Catholic elementary school and I still, to this day, remember getting to a fight with kids like who would pick on me mercifully and I would just break their noses knock out mm-hmm. teeth and stuff like that. I learned to fight at a very young age. And well, it's just like remembering I, I, I knew. the principal tell me, she goes, well, Dennis, sometimes you just have to understand that kids aren't going to like you. Like, how do you tell that to kid? No, you tell yeah. the kid who's been mercifully picking on me, whose parent happens to be part of the PTA and has yeah. a one income family and they can survive and survive. Meanwhile, two parent ho- household with four incomes, five incomes coming in from two parents and we're barely getting by. They don't have time to be part of the PTSA. So yeah, maybe you should tell the kid that's that is a little bit of favorite who has been yeah. parents that donate money outside of tuition. Why don't you tell him it's not being an asshole instead of telling me, "Hey, learn with living, learn to live with everyone not liking you." Well, it's like the 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 principal of my school when I was still in school uh, thought it was all bullshit. Like she gave me such a hard because <laughs> she was like she was the one that had to sign my work permit when I was a kid, and like she didn't believe anything that I said or my parents said. Like she, if you, if you asked her what I was doing when I wasn't in school, she would tell you that I was like rather doing background work or hanging around sets, begging for jobs. 
<laughs> she didn't like even like even like after things with me in it started coming out and like I was on TV regularly or like you know movies and shit like that refused to believe it. Absolutely it's photoshopped. <laughs> yes, I did a movie. Uh, the thing that got me stabbed was I did a movie, uh, a TV movie with Little Romeo and Master P, and I had pictures with them, and I printed out those pictures and I brought them to school to show my friends, and the kids fucking hated that, so they stole them and tore them up and dragged me in the bathroom and stabbed me with a pen. Her thing was, well, you shouldn't have brought that kind of thing to school. Where did you go to school? San Quentin Penitentiary? <laughs> Dude, for real. Like, that's honestly what it was. Like, if, like, there were kids, there were, like, fucking 12-year-olds <laughs> that had this, like, prison mindset. <laughs> and you know what? Most of them are in prison now. <laughs> <laughs> so school did prepare them for something. I, I, I follow up on a lot of those kids. It's like, I'll just, like, search them on Facebook, and it's like, gang tattoos on their faces and I'm like oh well I'm glad you amounted to a whole load of nothing <laughs> I'll send you a copy of my book in the clink you asshole <laughs> you'll have somebody who at the jail read it for you because you never learned to read while you were in school yeah you were you were you were too busy lighting the walls on fire and stabbing me with a pen like it was a shiv <laughs> oh my god what part of LA did you grow up in the valley, okay. like the Van Nuys area, which should be like that. That tracks. Okay, <laughs> I guess. I, uh, yeah, I mean, I know, I know you don't know. Nothing but. to me. I mean, it's, I've heard of the Van Nuys. I've heard of the Valley. Yeah. Is it bad? I don't know. Again, I'm from Baltimore, so I have a different perspective on what's bad. Uh, well, granted, I didn't get stabbed in school. I did have guns pulled on me, so you know. I mean, I I, I have a lot of love for the Valley. I the the Valley will always Van Nuys will always be home. Like I was born in Panorama City, which is like arguably one of the worst parts of the Valley. Um, but it's like the Valley is known for two things, gangs, and that's where they make all the porn. (laughs) And sometimes you'd see both happening at the same time. (laughs) Those are the times where I would pull over and just watch. (laughs) (laughs) Roll down the window. Yep. Only a crack, though. Only a crack. You're not rolling down your window all the way in Panorama City. You're just like... <laughs> I just want to be able to hear her screams. <laughs> <laughs> I also I also appreciate that we went with, like, the noise of rolling a window down versus, like, the crank. <laughs> well, you gotta like, update we're still, your jokes, Like, we're right? still in the 40s, yeah. yeah. We're, we're, Most we're, people are gonna be like, roll the window down. Yeah, no, we're all... We're all in our improv classes, we're all miming iPhones and no longer... <laughs> Miming the flip phones anymore, okay? We got the iPhone. Oh, yeah, no, no. This, 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 is still, this is still satisfying. <laughs> I mean, it looks right, but you know what? When you're doing it, you got to do the one little, oh, yeah, no, oh, yeah, yeah no, okay. See, th- this, my, my imagination's too vivid. I can imagine a lot of things. Like, he's holding a sandwich to his face. Why? Like, <laughs> I just want to hear the ham. loaf of banana bread. <laughs> <laughs> so, growing up after high school, did you end up going to college? Was there any other plans than entertainment? Yeah, I mean, I I, I went to college four times. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I went. To, I'm not judging. I went to six years of junior college and didn't graduate. No, oh, no, I mean, that's the thing. I, I I I never finished because like I I graduated high school a year early, uh, and I took a year off, and then I went from that year off into USC. I got through like the introductory week at SC and then booked a TV show that took me away from SC. I did that TV show for a while. Uh, my time on it ended. And then I went, I got into Cal arts and went to Cal arts for about a month. If even booked a movie that took me away from Cal arts. Oh, see, that's so crazy. Uh, like I did so much of like, like I went to school for radio production, television production, mm-hmm. And even while I was still in class, I started working in radio. So I just adjusted yeah. my work schedule and my school schedules to match. And it's like, I can, can do, like, I'm already working in radio. Why am I working towards a radio degree? But I was just like, just, I'm a completist. Yeah. I don't know. I'm crazy, insane. But yeah, I, I mean, that, that's I, the thing. Radio, cause, my, cause then the I, radio station I worked at was a mile down the street from the college. Like, it was very perfect yeah. location for me. But, you know, if you're filming and, a thing, that's now a 40 hour a week job plus yeah. 40 hours plus working on set and, and two months. That, that's the thing. It's like like the time on set plus like I couldn't if I was on set, I couldn't be in class. And 
when I was when I was at SC, it was for filmmaking, obviously. When I was at Cal Arts, it was experimental animation, the same uh, program Tim Burton did. Mm -hmm. And it's like those programs are both so intensive, you can't you can't miss weeks at a time yeah. to go work. You fall behind on the coursework, you're fucked. And like I realized that very early on, so I was like, all right, you know, it's probably better that I I step away versus like try to flounder in it. Uh, and then after Cal Arts, I went to cinema makeup school for makeup effects for like two weeks, and then booked another <laughs> show that took me away from it. Uh, and then after that, I did LA Film for the love of God, stop booking things program. in the fall. Just wait until pilot season. Dude, I know. I know. That's the thing. <laughs> I did, I did I did SC, I did Cal Arts, I did Cinema Makeup School, and I did LA Film School. Every time, like, LA Film School was the farthest I had gotten. LA Film School I left more or less of my own accord, because it was like, by then, I'd been in the industry, like, almost 20 years. And I was taking these, these intro film classes, and I'm like, I don't need this education. It was like, I already know fucking everything they're trying to teach me. And I, I had talked to a friend of mine who had actually completed that program. Uh, I mean, a whole lot of good it did him. He was a bartender. <laughs> but he was. He he told me he was like, well, yeah, dude. Like with your experience, you're not really gonna get anything out of it until maybe the last six months. He's like, and even then, it's not gonna be a lot. Yeah, and I was what's like, the point? Like, can you test yeah. out of it? All right, cool. I have the degree of a thing that I already yeah. know. Yeah, I I see. Where well, you know, going. I. I I, I had, uh, part of that decision too was like, I, I had met Kevin Smith at an event and, uh, you know, I, I, I had to gush. I, I told him straight up. I was like, dude, you know, your movies are the reason why I'm in film school. Your movies are the reason like you, you've, you've shown me that it can be done. Like you're the reason why I want to be a, a, a writer and a director. And he looks at me and he goes, you're in film school. And I went, yeah. And he goes, bad idea. I'm like, really? I'm like he, he very famously didn't finish film school. He quit and came back and made clerks. Uh, and he told me straight up, he was like, now's not the time for filmmakers to be in film school. Now's the time for filmmakers to make films. So I was like, all right, fuck it. <laughs> Kevin Smith says I don't got to do it. I'm not going to do it. Uh, and it was like, yeah, it was like, I, I, I knew the majority of what they were teaching me anyway. It's like, you know, they, they, I'd been making short films on my own that entire time. Anyway, my book came from a short film that I made, but it's like, you know, when they, when they send you your copy of premiere, so you can start taking the intro level editing class in the first, the entire first lesson is like how to import footage. <laughs> Meanwhile, like I've got, you know, a short film that I, I post converted to VHS with like, you know, split colors and, and, and tracking on it. I'm like, I don't, I don't need to be taking this class. Yeah. There's some remedial stuff like that where you're at, where if you're yeah. working towards a goal, you got to figure it out somehow. Some people figure it out on there. Yeah. Some figure it out in schools, you know, you know, I, the, the shit I didn't know I YouTubed, right? You could do that in that age. Like when I was growing up yeah. in the nineties, there was no YouTube. There was no tutorials on the internet. I was lucky to find a TV. What was his name? Tom Savini. I think it was had yeah. a, that VFX low budget VFX TV show that I stumbled across mm -hmm. how to make blood from Kara syrup and red. red <laughs> now, now he's got a whole school for it, right? Like yeah. here, here's how to pretend to do a bullet hole, paint a button, mm -hmm. a skin color, draw blood here, tape it to the forehead, fishing line, pull the gun. Bloop, and there you go. Bullet to the head. Mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, you couldn't find those things out now. Also with the way VFX are now, I can make bullet holes. Things on my oh, yeah. iPhone, you know. I mean, like, yeah. When when I when I was a kid too, there wasn't like as much of that. So it's like when I was making you know zombie shorts in my garage when I was you know sixteen or seventeen. It was a lot of like, all right, well, if I take these chunks of silicone and soak them in in the fake blood and put them in your mouth when you puke, it'll look really gross. <laughs> or like, yeah, you know, I mean, if, if if I take. I take liquid latex and lay it on a mirror and then peel it off. It looks like dead skin, like that kind of shit. Yeah, I mean, there was, I mean, we're exponential. Like, you know, when you were 16, what, in the early 2000s, I was in my yeah. early 20s. 
And then everything seemed impossible, and we started having more and more things available to us. And it's just exponentially has grown, you know, the, our mm-hmm. knowledge base. You know, what we're going to see, you know, in that short period of time, like 10 years ago, like look at what YouTube uh, footage was last year, you know, 10 years ago compared to now. And then compared to 10 years before that, when YouTube first started, mm-hmm. like we've grown so much in quality exponentially so fast. You know, oh, so dude, even some, some of the some of the edits young, I see, I thought, oh look, all you kids have all these things. Yeah, you have all these tools to your your thing. When I was uh, y- younger, and I could say to the kids, oh, you have all now. When I'm in my 40s, even now, what's accessible is beyond belief to the people that was just yeah. 20 years ago. Some of the, some of the stuff I see on like Instagram reels that I'm like, I know you edited that on your phone. Yeah is so fucking impressive. And then, like, I'll sit there and, like, deconstruct, like, okay, I can figure out how you did this. It's just a lot of work, and I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, coming from the DIY world myself, like, this podcast yeah. alone might, just talking about it, like, the amount of effort I put into making this, at this, just this, is already... A, oh, yeah. Team. There's teams, of, like, oh, you listen to the Smartless guys, you know, the... the yeah. Will Arnett and and, and uh, Jason Bateman, Jason Bateman, and and yeah. you know from Will and Grace guy Sean, whatever his name is. Oh yeah, they Sean talk is. about how easy it is to make a podcast. Like fuck you, it's not easy. You show up, you talk, like, you leave. Sure Everybody for you, does work. They paid yeah. eighty million dollars to let you just stand around and talk, and they're still paying another eighty million dollars in staff to make it. Yeah, and I mean that's 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 the same as my book. Because like I'm I'm independently publishing my book, so it's like. Every single aspect of it is something I have to deal with. Like when I when I wrote the damn thing, <laughs> I had no idea that I was gonna have to reformat every single line of it to fit the correct dimensions of a book. Oh god. Like I if if I just make one little budge, you know, nudge one little file in Premiere yeah. sets everything off and I can, you know, mm-hmm. control Z my way through it or or fix it or if aspect ratios are just a little bit off for the TikTok social media, you're gonna fire the program back up, we'll open it all up, go back through it, mm-hmm. move everything around, and refine out what the dimensions are. I can't imagine having to go through a whole book, of whatever, 200, 300 pages book, and just make sure Four. every 400 page <laughs> book, you tell I don't read. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like, that's like, like, I, because, you know, a word processor automatically sets it for eight and a half by 11. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure the people that have been here before are listening to this just like, you fucking idiot, of course. <laughs> uh, a word processor automatically sets for 8.5 by 11, but my paperbacks are 5 by 8, and my hardcovers are 6 by 9. So everything had to be shifted, and then it's also like, I had to learn what the fuck a gutter margin was <laughs> on the inside between the pages. And it's it's like, Oh here, here, I'll 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 show you because I've got seven thousand copies of it around me at any given time. It's like some some pages don't actually. This is one of the good ones. Don't <laughs> format properly. So you have books so you, that have different like, prints that are yeah, di- like yeah. different words on like one or two page difference. Yeah, because like there 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 are some things where it's like the words won't hyphenate properly and the word processor will space the words to fill the line. So like there, my first, uh, my first box of proof copies, you know, there were, there was lines where it was like three words that I then had to go back and adjust oh my God. every single line. And it's like, you know, you do the, you do the, the, the cover art and shit like that. And you think it all just uploads but then it's like, I'm, I'm, you know, it's, it's set up hardback and paperback through Amazon as well as the ebook. But then I'm also set up with a distributor, uh, for brick and mortar stores and uploading the cover to them had to be different than the cover to Amazon. The cover on Amazon had to be different between each versions. And it's like, you know, you, you, you move the art a millimeter in one direction, suddenly you've got a big black space on your cover. Oh, because Jesus. it tells That's, you. I mean, it's similar to yeah. podcasts. <laughs> where it's like, back in the day when podcasts started, 
iTunes wanted one dimension and then Stitcher yeah. wanted another and this. Now it's at least organized where it's like, hey, if you just make it this size, we could figure it out for everybody mm-hmm. else. But back there was a time where I had to have, you know, if I wanted to be on different platforms, I had to make six different podcast logos for this one podcast and unload it to different places. So talking about the, since we're on subject of the, the fucking book, differences. Yeah. One hard black, one. <laughs> yeah. But there's an aspect ratio difference there. Like that you can't just well, shrink then, it then down. It's, it's also like, you know, the author bio needed to change location. <laughs> it's all just like such stupid little shit. Well, I but guess yeah, that's like, what a publisher is supposed to be good for. <laughs> they take too much money. I didn't want a publisher. Yeah, if I, I, if I, I went with a, if I went with like... if I went with a traditional publisher, I'd make like twenty cents a copy. Now I make a dollar a copy. Do you feel like being tutored and work and doing schoolwork from home, having to be a homeschooler? Do you think that prepared you for being able to do some of the more DIY aspect stuff that we as entertainers do now, especially with you as a writer? Absolutely, because it's, I mean, working on things hours on end, nose to the book, you know, that kind of of experience through those formative years really instilled the, like, it's cool, I'll do it myself attitude. So it's like, if if I don't want to, like, in any kind of entertainment, finding someone to do it for you is such a pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. There's so many you know, gates you got to get through and hoops you got to jump through that it's like, it's easier and it's almost easier and more rewarding to do it yourself. And like, I mean, I, I'd been making my own short films since I was 16 and it, those were all me figuring shit out and doing it on my own, trying to write for what I could do versus writing for what I wanted to do. And now it's, it's like, that's just the way I operate now. You know, I, I, I talked about this uh, on a different podcast, but when I, when I finished, or not even when I finished the book, I sent the first eight chapters out to publishers and I had two different publishers put in offers on it. But it's like, at the end of the day, their offers were kind of, I mean, not to disparage them because I, I, I did make sure to keep the relationships alive with these publishers, but their offers were kind of garbage. Yeah. It's like a first time author. You make, you get a $5,000 advance. That's it. And then you get paid again after they've recouped the $5,000 advance and print costs. So it's like for a first time author or really for any author to start seeing money back on a book, you have to basically guarantee that it's going to be a New York times bestseller. Um, it has to at least sell 3000 copies. <laughs> Just to start making money again. Yeah, even that bar now of being a New York Times best-selling book doesn't hold the weight that it used to. Like, no. because so many books aren't being sold or being bought now that the barrier for being a New York Times best-selling book is kind of lower. Which, not to disparage yeah. anyone, some people that's a great accomplishment. So other people, it's kind of like, hey, if we release it on this week when sales are usually slow. And if we do, mm. if we buy this many pre-orders ourselves, once it comes out, we cancel the pre-orders and we're a New York Times bestselling author. Like there's yeah, I mean, they, tricks to that as well, which is yeah. under, underhanded, but it's, it's, you know, it's the kind of thing where it's like, like, yeah, that bar, that bar is definitely a little lower, but I still look at it like, fuck, it'd be nice to reach it. Cause it's like yeah. New York Times bestseller. You have to sell uh 3000 copies in the first week. Okay. And like, I know my book is. My book is a little nichey to sell 3,000 <laughs> copies in the first week, but one can fucking hope. Um, no, yeah, it's like, you know, the traditional publishing deal, it's like, I was only going to get five grand for it. They were going to own the licensing rights. It wasn't going to come out for like two years. And I was like, my, my big thing was honestly, I wanted to retain a hundred percent of the rights. Um, uh, like I, I don't want to be told what I can and can't do with it. Like if I, if I want to take and make it a cartoon, I can license the rights to make it a cartoon. If I want to, you know, I, I, I've been talking to a production company about doing uh, the audio book as a radio play. You. And I'm like, I can do that if I want to. If I was with a publisher, the publisher would have to sign off on that too because it's their IP too. And I'm like, I, I, in, in, the, in the age where IP is king, where you know, I. The number one thing I've been telling writers at this point, like friends of mine that write and writers in general, is that 
nobody wants to read your 200 page magnum opus screenplay about how shitty your childhood was but if you turn it into a 400 page novel they'll buy it sight unseen <laughs> just and then they'll want to turn it into a, a 200 page script <laughs> yep yep or they'll be like you know what this is a six episode miniseries but it's like like Retain like where where studios aren't looking for original content unless that original content is a thing first. Like they 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 don't they don't like if I, the, the, this this book is something that I tried to do as a series of short films uh, like seven years ago with the idea of I was going to use those short films as a proof of concept pilot. Nobody wants the proof of concept pilot. They want the IP it came from. Hmm. That's interesting because I was going to ask, what was the impetus like you were working in film for all these years? Why write a book? You know, you said this book was based on a short film that you already wrote. Why write it in this medium? Did you find the medium to be more expanding? Was it better for you? Was it testing out something different? But it was because, hey, I have a better chance of selling this idea if it's already a published book. That's an interesting way to look at going into some other medium. I mean, I mean, really, it's it's yes to all those questions. Just because the the big thing was, I was working uh, uh, with a friend of mine in a different production company, adapting it, or not even adapting it, but like we were reworking the original idea of the short film into uh, an animated pilot. And the the big thing is like, there's a lot of elements of like detective noir to it, where the main character is both narrating the book in the first person, but also has a uh, a concurrent running monologue in his head. Mm. And it's like when we were writing the pilot, how much of it he was narrating it through his inner monologue. My friend was like, you know, honestly, this is a book. And I was like, yeah, I mean, I could see that because, you know, every scene he's narrating a good chunk of it (laughs) and like just being quippy in his head and shit. (laughs) Um, so I, I sat down and I was like, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna see what happens. I, I took the first scene from the the pilot and I just started writing it as a novel and that first scene ended up being like nineteen pages. It's the first chapter of the book, and then I was like, Alright, let me see if I can do it again and then twenty two chapters later I had seventy six thousand words and I was like, It's a pretty fucking cool book. Okay. <laughs> but really it was like like, you know, Yes, the idea of, you know, having an IP was very large in the, that decision. Because like I said, you know, no, nobody wants the original idea unless it's something else first. Like, studios only want to adapt shit now. Um, I mean, that's also a very big generalization, but it's also not wrong. Uh, <laughs> but really, it was like, like I I just enjoyed that process so much of... Like, I can do whatever the fuck I want. There's no limitation. I don't have to worry about, like, well, would this be expensive to shoot? Or would this be expensive to animate? Or how the fuck would this happen practically? Like, I can do whatever the fuck I want. And there was no one to tell me no. There was no, like, <laughs> there, there there, was no interference in the process at all. It's like, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, you know, dedicated and doubled down on this idea now of, like, fuck it, I'll just be an author. Hmm. I, can, I can write as much as I want, as much as I can, whatever the fuck I want, whatever the fuck I can. And it's, it's like, at the end of the day, you know, actor, storyteller, comedian, it's all just storytelling anyway. And when I boiled it all down, that's what I enjoyed most about those, those three career paths, was like, I just enjoyed telling the stories. Particularly when I was doing stand-up, when I left stand-up, it was like, I didn't enjoy doing stand-up, I enjoyed writing the material and figuring out how the material went together. I could have given a fuck how the audience felt. <laughs> <laughs> like, that was 100% for me. I could have given a shit about the audience. I'm having a similar thing with my, my tour is, you know, doing tour guides, doing Boston Duck Tours, where I want to tell these long stories about certain things yeah. that I found interesting. And every tour guide who does nobody wants to hear long stories. Nobody wants to hear long stories. Well, that's because you don't tell them well. Like, I'm entertaining. Yes. I literally had my trainer. You know, I was struggling a long time with this Boston Doctor stuff, learning material, 
loving the material, figuring out what to talk about, what's good in this. And I'm still figuring it all out. One day I did, uh, there's a story that I love to tell about a guy named William Dawes. William Dawes did everything Paul Revere did on the same night. He just did, in my opinion, better, faster, and longer. Should have been the name of his autobiography. Well, you can't write an autobiography, but it should have been the name of his biography. William Dawes, better, faster, longer. But there was a whole day where we knew we were going to have alternate routes, and I was going to have that free time to tell this long story because I can't tell William Dawes without telling him about Paul Revere. I can't assume that you know everything about Paul Revere, right? So I have to tell Paul, Re- Paul Revere, William Dawes, and then my story about William Dawes is a lengthy story. I can cut it down, mm-hmm. but when you cut it down, you miss a jokes, which is what I care more about than anything else, but maintaining yeah. that narrative. So I can cut it down and I can do it in pieces and chunks, you know, but I'm still leaving a lot to the, to the people on the tour to kind of understand and follow along quickly. But my, one of my, uh, another, my longer version of stories, which is when we're talking about long stories, we're talking like two minutes, 90 seconds, that's three not, minutes that's at most. Long. You know, it's not like I'm doing, when you're driving 20 mile, 25 miles an hour through the city and you could point out, here's this thing, here's this thing, here's this thing. Two yeah. minutes is a long time. Most of the uh, stuff okay, we talk about fair. 10 to 30 seconds at most, you know, comparatively. Sure. And I agree. I don't, I agree with you. Two to three minutes is not long, but in the shortened aspect you know, of people's brains and tension spans, it's long. But one of them is a story about uh, John Crane, who was someone who participated in the Boston Tea Party. And my trainer mm-hmm. said, you do the best version of that story I've ever heard. You actually made me care about John Crane. Right. And it's because I'm telling an interesting story. I got them like I can yeah. hold their intentions for the most part. If you're on this tour and you want to be entertained, I'm going to entertain you. Right. If you want to be on here, take pictures of big things and not listen to me talk and chat with your friends. I'm not the tour guide for you. It's going to be a boring event for you. I'm going to give you some jokes. I'm going to give you some interest. I'm going to give you enthusiasm because that's just how I talk. Mm. Like right now when I'm doing this podcast. It's better on video now, guys. Please go to the Comedy <laughs> Network on YouTube. He's you very animated. The podcast now. Yeah, if, if, if you're animated. not watching the video, he's very animated. <laughs> <laughs> and I was animated when it was audio only. My job in radio, do you know how many times yeah, I, I, know, I know you were? And just move it around with me when I was doing on air stuff. Now, I, <laughs> I mean, this is a little more, you know, I can, this, this makes a little too much noise. I can't, I can't, I can't yeah. just grab this and talk around and move like I used to do in radio, but I'm still animated enough to where I'm talking, you know, and I'm exuberant. That's just how I am. I look my audience in the face. You know how many tour guides, like the seat that we sit in on these vehicles is literally adjacent. Here's the driver. Here's me. There's everybody else. Right. Sure. So many tour guides just sit in this chair like this and they talk and maybe they'll look over that way. Maybe they'll look o- over in the street and whatever this today. And they sit here. Yeah, I, that's probably what I, I sit do. sideways <laughs> on it the, all day long. I'm banging into the back of the, the, the back of the the dashboard behind me, just hitting the dashboard because the seat's right here. Because I'm pointing out here. I'm pointing over there. I'm talking. I'm looking you guys in the face. And trust me, when you're a tour guide and you're looking people in the face and they don't care, it freaking hurts. <laughs> <laughs> you could see that's it in probably, the that's face. That's why I, I wouldn't. Yeah. Oh, is it my turn turn to drive the boat now? Yay! Let me take my pictures, my selfies. All right, it's a t- <laughs> John Crane. No, but I mean that's 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 kind of my point. You know, it's like we're fucking storytellers, and I've I've told so many writer friends, like you know, I have friends with stacks of pilots that have never gone anywhere. And I'm like, yeah, but if if you love that story and you want to tell that story and you want to get it in front of people. If you want people to enjoy your story, like make it a fucking book. No <laughs> one can tell you. You can't. That's like, I've, I've got this. This book is the first in a series, but beyond that, like I've every idea and screenplay that I've had in the last like decade that I never did anything with are all getting converted to novels now. Hmm. So it's like, I, I plan on releasing a novel a year for the next, like, 10 or 12 years. Oh, wow. Oh, that's ambitious. And also, just thought plans of how much to do that hurts so much. <laughs> uh, the, 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 current, the current idea is, I, I wrote this one in about five months. I know some of them are going to take a little longer, but it's like, 
right from four, right for like four to six or seven months. Take a month off, promote it for the rest. Take a month off, right again. Take a month off. I mean, th- this one particularly. Like, I also understand. Like, as a as an independent author, you don't really start making money on books until you've got at least three. Well, on that, since you brought up the money thing, like. I mean, I'm working four days a week, 10 to 12, 14 hour days doing tours. And I got three days off. And those, if I'm lucky, I've been working six, you know, I just, this is my first three days off in three weeks where the only day Mm -hmm. I had off in three weeks where I didn't have anything to do was 4th of July. And what I need to do was clean my house, take care of my dog, sit with her. And it's the 4th of freaking July. Thank God it rained because then I didn't feel bad about not going out to a barbecue. But it's all these things that it's like, like this week, just trying to get episodes of this podcast out, recording episodes and doing stuff. I can't find the time to put all that together because I need to go to my job and do that. When I was a freelancer, mm-hmm. tons of time to work on stuff, but time, you know, it was every time that I wasn't here work in the studio, working on my stuff, I had to be out on the street, finding work and, and making money so I could stay. And it's a tough road to hoe where you're trying yeah. to like constantly trying to find work. Cause when you're a freelancer, finding the jobs are a full-time job in itself, not yeah. to mention also doing the jobs. So where are you, you know, not to get too deep into your finances, where are you finding the ability to be able to take six months to write a book? You know, I mean, obviously you got to be working or something like, are you doing, Oh yeah. I mean, I, where's I just the don't, I, I'm coming from. I don't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I have, uh, I have a job and I have a side gig and I do them both concurrently. And then I, I come home and I write, you know, till like 2 a.m. And then I sleep for a couple of hours and I'm up and doing shit again. And it's, it, you know, it's the writing of it wasn't the pain in the ass in juggling everything else. Now it's been the marketing of it that's been such a, a, a higher mountain to climb. Yeah, it's, it's why, like, I'm saying now with the next one, I'll write for X amount of months until it's done. And then I'm taking a full month off before I get into everything else on it. Just cause like, and then after I'm done with it, I'm going to take a month off again, just because promoting it and because I'm doing it independently, making content to promote it and finding reviewers and all that is so taxing and time consuming. (laughs) Um, But no, I mean, I, I just, I, I try to, you know, if if I have an hour, that's usually what I'm doing in that hour. See, that's one of the problems yeah. with working on podcasts. Like an hour, if I have an hour free to edit, three minutes of work will get done. Like, like, yeah, like yeah. I mean, that's completely app, different. Yeah. Firing up the app, waiting for it to open, yeah. getting myself organized. Maybe there's some ADHD problems there. I don't think I have a ADHD because I have a OCD. I don't know how I can be hyper focused on being unfocused. That doesn't sound like <laughs> my therapist got those two correct uh, diagnoses. But there's there's a sitcom in there. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like by the time I get the app fired up, load the files, get to it, I get twenty minutes worth of work, and it's like got yeah. nowhere done on it. You know, sometimes yeah. I can work remotely from my phone. Like I I've done that plenty of times where I'm like, oh, I need to upload. I need to render out videos. All right. Well, I need to leave. So I'll run the media encoder, let them render out. I'll leave, open my phone, check on them. All right, cool. They're done rendering. Let me upload those files and I can do some work remotely while walking around. But it's also like when you're you got your face in your phone and you're walking around doing things like it's a, my life is all multitasking. Like even just traveling on train, like you drive a car, you can't work while you're driving. I can sit on a bus, but when you're on a bus for 10 minutes, you get off, you transfer it to the next train. That's a, five minute wait. So what are you going to get done in five minutes? Get on the train. It's another 15 minutes. Now, granted my train ride has been 45 minutes, but it's all small little segments where I need to pay attention. I can't be on my phone while walking through crowded streets and crossing things over and trying Mm -hmm. to make my way to other trains, making my way through the world today. You know, like it's I'm Vanessa Carlton, my way from job to job, from home to job and trying to find time to do things in between. Maybe I'm making excuses or also maybe it's just sometimes harder. And I feel bad for those people who also have the hard road to row, road to row on all of this as well, or hard road. To I, mean, I, 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 I also, I also like, I am, I am fairly lucky in this regard that like my day job when there's downtime, 
I can sit there with my notebook and like they think I'm being real productive when really I'm not. <laughs> I'm not working on anything for them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had that job when I moved here to the Boston. Yeah. My first job was or the job that brought me up here was writing traffic reports for television and radio. I worked yeah. a four hour shift, had five hours off, worked a four hour shift. And in that four hours, I might do an hour and a half worth of work because I have to, yeah. my work is when traffic incidents happen. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of times where I'm at work and traffic hasn't happened yet. And I'm over here on my computer doing some work for comedy doing my social media stuff, pr- programming all stuff, making designs and stuff. And now when I have that, you know, I always kept saying, well, if I didn't have to work, if I only worked 40 hours a week, then I'd have so much time to do everything else. And meanwhile, when I had a 40 hour a week job, still couldn't find t- time to do things. You know, when you're going around, when you're sleeping, you're living, you know, and it's, I commend you for being able to, to, Hey, I'm going to take those couple minutes and work and do this stuff. Cause I've been there where I was like, all right, hopefully the boss won't see me making a flyer for my upcoming comedy show. Yeah. I mean, I, I, def- I definitely will say, like, if I was still doing comedy, I would never have, have had the time. Just because that's such a... Like, that, that's kind of the reason why I walked away in the first place. It was like, I don't want to invest any more in this than I already have. Like, I just didn't... I didn't love it enough to invest more in it than I already had. And it's like... If I was still doing that, there's no fucking way this book would have gotten written. <laughs> because any free time I had, I would have been, you know, contractually obligated to be like, don't forget to fill out those raffle tickets. <laughs> um, We're going to pick one lucky winner to get a pair of tickets yeah. to see. To come back here and see these same <laughs> shitty comics try again. <laughs> if you liked them tonight, you'll love them two months from now. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I mean, there's a grind and it's going out there and like, you know, I'm not hitting the streets on comedy since the pandemic as I was during the pandemic. You know how hard I yeah. work doing comedy. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah. You know, and I want to do it. I need to, and I still need to. And trust me, I love this job doing Boston Duck Tours, but it does not feel the, it does not fill the cessational need that I need of being on stage and performing. And I feel bad. Sure. Like the past three days could have gone to an open mic, could have gone to a comedy show, could have done something. Yes. And I didn't. I was here working on these podcasts because I need to get these ahead of schedule. You know, I need to dedicate those hours. It's a beautiful, gorgeous day. That's finally not humid outside. And I was like, I'm in a dank basement that is entirely too humid. (laughs) Even, even when I was doing comedy, I would rather watch a grainy super eight tape of my own conception (laughs) than go to an open mic. (laughs) It's terrible. It is. Dude, fuck open mics. <laughs> Dude, I only go to open mics because I need when I need to write on stuff. And at that time, also, I need now to reestablish myself in the scene because I'm not a part of it anymore. And God knows what everybody's been talking about about me to other yeah. new comedians because uh, I know what they've said about around my behind my back in messenger groups because people send it to me. Oh, yeah. They're like, I'm hey, sure by I'm the way. A lot of that too. Yeah. But yeah. it's, you know, so you got to go out and do that grind again. And it's, I'm not going to go to open mics and do tested material. I need to work on some of it. But you know, I can work on stage. I'm good enough to where you book me on a show. Maybe I'm not going to be the 10 that I used to be, but I'm going to be an eight and a half, right? At best, yeah. you know, at worst, I'll be a seven. You know, I need to write stuff. I have new things that I've been thinking about that I need to write. Hey, you know what? Give me a 15 minutes not. You're going to get five. You're going to get seven minutes of solid stuff. You're going to get five minutes of solid on the end, seven minutes on at the top. And you know what? I'm going to take that three, four minutes in the middle to work this, this out in front of an audience. You know, I, I'm at that level where I can do that. You know, I'm not going to say that's yeah. what everybody should be doing, especially you noobs. I mean, more or less though, but, but you know, I mean, that's I, where some other people get, but fighting for that. Oh, you haven't been on stage. Like I'm doing five 80 minute shows a day, four day, four to six days a week. I can handle stand up comedy. Yeah. I can stand up. The, the, the thing, the thing that I always, I mean, I still think is pretty funny is like, I, I decided to stop. I didn't tell anybody I decided to stop. <laughs> you told me because I asked you when I was in town. I, no, yeah, I, t- I told you. I was like, hey, I'm in I LA. Let's go to an open mic. Let's do some comedy. You're like, absolutely I, not. <laughs> fuck no. I didn't tell anybody that books that I decided to stop. They just <laughs> like somehow through the universe decided like, all right, we're good. And stop booking me anyway. <laughs> I was waiting. I was waiting for the email to be like, 
We need you fucking three shows back to back in the YooHoo room hosting and running tech and running the raffle and bringing everyone their food and making sure all the guests get a sloppy hand job under the table. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I was waiting for it to be like, actually, I think I'm going to take some time off. And then I never got those emails. <laughs> and I was like, all right, it's fine. <laughs> but I mean, like, I've, I, I had a friend uh, fairly recently offer me seven minutes in the belly room at the comedy store. And I was like, Nope. <laughs> I had I had another friend that books a, a a small room in North Hollywood that was like, how m- like he was like hypothetically, how much money would I have to pay you to get you to do stand up again? And I was like, that check doesn't have enough space for all this. <laughs> send me, send them my email. <laughs> gun to I mean it's it's also like I I I was talking to a different comedian on a different podcast where he was like. You think you'd ever go back? And I was like, ah, oh, I'm sure I'll get the itch. I know that's not true. <laughs> Look, I've gotten the itch since I've stopped and been like, are you stupid? No. <laughs> Look, I don't fault anybody for getting out of this business. There's so many talented people, but you have to do what makes you happy. If doing this mm-hmm. makes you miserable, then get out of it. You know, I want everybody that was exactly great it. And happy and funny and audience to love them. And I want everybody to be happy doing this. But if it doesn't yeah. bring you joy, don't do it. I'm never going to fault anybody for that. You know, I know not doing this does not bring me joy. I know I need this to survive. And that's the sad thing. Yeah. It's much more sad than the, Hey, you know what? I got a wife and kids. Now my wife laughs at my jokes. My kids laugh at my jokes. And that's all I need. I have those friends are doing yeah. the same thing with music. Hey, I like going playing cover songs at the open mics. I like playing cover songs at a bar on a Sunday afternoon. All right. If you don't want that, if that's what you want, instead of having original music and you are truly happy, and you're not regretful, then good on you. I'm happy for you. I want you to yeah. be happy. For me, I know those aren't my happiness. Like having a kid, I just don't want to be the parent that hates his and resents his kid. All my friends who have kids are like, no, it's different when you have. I'm like, what if it's not different? All right. Yeah. What, what if I'm the one that's like, you little piece of shit? Like you ruined my life. You, I could have <laughs> been something more. But it was you that came into this life. Those people exist. Was, That's a real I was going to be a star. I, I was going to be the next Mimi Van Doren. I don't know why I went with such an old fucking <laughs> reference. It's someone that had a kid in the 30s, apparently. But yeah. They were going to put me in the talkies. <laughs> <laughs> but then you came along and you ruined my body. <laughs> I had a perfect hourglass figure. Now I'm shaped like a clock face. <laughs> I, w- I had an hourglass figure. Now I'm shaped like a grandfather clock. I ding every hour. <laughs> you don't want to see where my pendulum is. <laughs> That's how I make our rent money, by showing my pendulum to the boys <laughs> in the alley. <laughs> So Adam, where can everybody find your book? <laughs> uh, so the the ebook is available for pre order now. Uh, unfortunately, I can't do a pre order for the paperback and the hardcover, but those will also be available the same day as the ebook, October thirteenth. Uh, we're also we're doing a launch event at the last bookstore in downtown LA <laughs> on October twelfth. That was the saddest sentence. <laughs> we're doing a live book. Signing at the very last bookstore to ever exist. Well, no, okay. It's, they, they call it the oh, last bookstore, but like, <laughs> it's not literally the last bookstore. <laughs> they, like, they even say it on their website, like their masthead says like, not literally or something like that. <laughs> but no, uh, we're doing, we're doing a, a launch event at the last bookstore on October 12th, uh, where you'll be able to buy the book early. You'll be able to buy the hardcover a day early there. Um, yeah, I'm, at that Adam Cagley on Instagram. The publisher is at IAF Press on Instagram. You can find all the links on our shared Instagrams. I post silly ass content related to the book <laughs> like every other day. Awesome. Well, I'm, marketing it. I'm just like silly. <laughs> this was. I hope this the was book awesome. does well. I can't wait Me to uh, read it myself. I'm going to order a, a copy because I am a supportive person, even if I don't I like horror. You. But. Uh, I don't hate horror. I just it's uh, it's horror comedy. It's oh good. Do, do, do you like do you like do you like Army of Darkness? Okay, if it's, if it's Army of Darkness style, then I'm going to be into it. I can't wait. Awesome. It's Ar- it's Army of Darkness meets the Dark Tower. Ooh, okay. That's that's a that's that sounds 
working after I worked on Castle Rock, I did a deep dive into a lot of Stephen King's work. Yeah. Just for like from wiki pages, not actually watching or reading anything, <laughs> just reading yeah. wiki pages. Uh, but I, it's insane the world that he's created. And I wish that oh, I yeah. was a King fan growing up. I wish that I read, I've read two books my entire life. Your book's going to be number three. The two books yeah. I've read was Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Not the same at all as my book. <laughs> and, well, here's the other one. Uh, the other one has nothing to do with your book. It is uh, How I Lost Five Pounds in Six Years, the autobiography of Tom Arnold. I don't know why I thought you were going to say, like, Jane Eyre. <laughs> <laughs> like, there was sense just something and sensibility. funny and uh. interesting about Tom Arnold's autobiography that I was, like, flipping through it and looking like, oh, I didn't I'm even know he had an autobiography. Oh, I this didn't was even also 20 one. years ago. <laughs> the fuck did Tom Arnold do that was that interesting to warrant, like, was there a whole section on on Roseanne? Actually, this is what the book there is the whole chapter about her. But this is what the book what caught me, my interest. He wrote the book while his wife was pregnant with his very first kid. So he okay. wrote this book to his kid, as if the every chap every title of a chapter was basically a question that his kid would have asked him about his life. Right? Like, who was this Roseanne person? What did you do in comedy? Why did you do so many drugs? Stuff like that. And then, and then the kid wasn't his. No, the kid was his. Well, I guess oh. he wrote the book before the kid was born while his wife was pregnant. But what I found Came interesting. out looking like John Goodman. <laughs> the kid, uh, he wrote every, responded to every question chapter title with a nickname and alternated boy and girl nicknames for the kid because they hadn't picked a name That's yet. That's clever. And they didn't know yeah. if the kid was going to be a boy or a girl. He talks about that in the thing. And I was like, this is very interesting. And I just yeah. kind of read about like how he was, you know, like. He was hired by a rich guy to teach his or to help his 18 year old daughter write a five minute stand up comedy bit. And he's on so many drugs that he's constipated and his stomach's killing him. And he goes in the bathroom, try to go in the bathroom and he can't. And he just starts stabbing himself in the stomach to try and loosen up all the constipation in his stomach from all the drugs. And then he goes and has sex with the 18 year old kid. It's like, that's a crazy story that even I can't even understand how a good looking man would do that. But if that book is meant to be things, it's why would you tell your child that? <laughs> the fuck is wrong with you, Tom Arnold? But I found it interesting. So, and you know, I, I had a library card then. <laughs> Fair. You yeah, know, my 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 book is is Army of Darkness, Dark Tower, Dash of Hellboy. Excellent. I can't wait for it. So, if you even uh, remotely and, like uh, any of those we're... things, you're gonna dig the shit out of it. And I, uh, this winter, I'll be back in LA this winter between uh, tour seasons here in Boston. So we're going to hang out, nice. whether it's at an open mic or at a pizza shop or just on a street corner. I take the pizza shop. You, you know, you're not going to get me to an open mic. <laughs> awesome. But I'll right. take you up thanks, on pizza. <laughs> thanks for being a part of this, Adam. Of course, buddy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>